Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we will continue with the applications of group action. So, first uh, we will see uh, the application uh, when we restrict to this uh, conjugacy action. So, the group G acts on itself via conjugation. So, let us recall what is what it is. So, let G be a group. So, then G acts on itself via this conjugacy action. So, what it is? So, which we denoted by C. So, it is a map from G to S G. So, given by G goes to this small G, C G. So, which is a map from G to G which sends X to G X G inverse. Okay. So, this is the map we called uh, the action of G on G via conjugation. So, this is very very interesting map. So, let us try to understand uh, all the terminologies uh, that uh, we introduce for the group action for this particular example. Okay. So, first of all uh, what is the, uh, the center as well as uh, the conjugation uh, sorry, the centralizer of some element. Okay, let's recall the center of G is defined to be those G in G such that that commutes with all elements of X in G. So that is called the center. Okay, this is called center of G. So now, given X in G. So, the centralizer of this x is defined to be those g in g such that g x equal to x g. Okay. And note that the center is nothing but intersection of all the centralizers of x and then x runs over g. So, this is immediate. Okay. So, now uh, we want to understand this action. Okay. For that purpose recall that the set is capital G. So, let us start using this set notation then it is clear what we mean. Then we are also interested in this uh, fixed points subsets. Okay. So, recall what it is this is those elements of capital X that are fixed by all elements of G. Okay. That means, whenever you act this capital G on this X then that should fix this X. So, that means G okay, let me use this uh, C G so that uh, let us not confuse. So, this C G of X is nothing but G dot X. Okay. So, those X in X such that C G of X should be X for all G in G. So, that is your X power G. So, if you rewrite this you can see that x power g is nothing but those x in capital X such that what is C g of x? C g of x is the conjugate of x by g that is g x g inverse which is equal to x for all g in g. So, what it is? It is exactly those elements in capital X such that that commute with all elements of capital G. So, which is nothing but the center, the center of G. Okay. Even though this is happening on the set side, since G is acting on G, so this uh, interesting fixed point subset becomes actually interesting subgroup which is the center. Okay. So, now what is the orbit, orbit of some element X? So, look at the orbit, orbit is going to be C G of X where G comes from capital G. So, by definition the orbit C G of X is G X G inverse and G is coming from G. So, this is nothing but the conjugacy class of X. So, this is called conjugacy class of X in capital G. So, the orbits are also very special. So, they are all conjugacy classes and the fixed point subset is nothing but the center. So, now uh, recall uh, what is the stabilizer? The stabilizer is G x 
okay so for x in capital x gx is nothing but cg of x okay so sorry stabilizer is a subset of g this is those g in g such that cg of x should be equal to x so this is actually a subgroup of g that we know so if we unravel the definition we can see that this is those elements of g such that gx g inverse equal to x so which is nothing but the centralizer of x in g because gx g inverse equal to x means x and g commutes okay so this equation is same as gx equal to xg so in this particular case the conjugation uh, action so we have the orbit is nothing but the conjugacy class gx g inverse where g in g and the stabilizer is nothing but the centralizer of x and this fixed point subgroup sorry fixed point subset is nothing but the center and similarly the kernel of c that is also center so all these things are there we have worked so now if we go back to this orbit decomposition theorem and then if we rewrite that equation in this example let's see what we are getting so recall what is this orbit decomposition theorem that tells the cardinal t of x equal to cardinal t of x power g plus summation the number of elements in the orbit where x runs over some indexing set lambda 1 so what is lambda 1 lambda 1 those elements in the indexing set such that the number of elements in the orbit should be greater than 1 okay so if you look at this orbit so this orbit is trivial when so this orbit has at least okay you can see that it has x so x is inside orbit of x so the orbit is singleton x if and only if gx g inverse should be equal to x for all g in g okay so that means the orbit is singleton x if and only if x should be inside the center okay so that is what it says so that means this uh, x power g that we collected so that will corresponds to the center and these elements will correspond to elements that are not in the center okay so if we rewrite that uh, orbit uh, decomposition in this case the cardinality of x equal to cardinality of g and the cardinality of x power g is nothing but the cardinality of the center plus summation we have this uh, number of elements in this orbit but using orbit stabilizer theorem the cardinality of orbit x is nothing but the index of the uh, gx inside g so now gx is nothing but the centralizer of x in g so in particularly in this case the number of elements in the orbit is nothing but index of this uh, gx inside g so which is cardinality of g divided by cardinality of cg of x because cg of x is gx here so if we replace that here we get cardinality of g equal to cardinality of the center of g plus the cardinality of g divided by cardinality of cg of x okay where x comes from some indexing set lambda 1 so lambda 1 is the indexing set so this is those x in capital lambda such that the cardinality of cg of x should be less than cardinality of g okay so this is very very important so this indexing set is chosen to be some particular indexing set from capital lambda capital lambda identified with this x modulo g so which is a set of all orbits okay so inside this we are choosing this lambda 1 such that the orbits that are having more than one elements that are indexed by this lambda 1 okay this is 
indexing set of those orbits that are having more than one helium okay so in this case if you translate that corresponds to those orbits that mean those conjugacy classes that are having more than one element so in terms of the centralizer the centralizer should be proper inside g okay so this is called actually class equation so it's a very very important uh, equation uh, to that actually kind of uh, encodes lots of information about the finite group okay and of course we have uh, derived all this for the finite group so let us write it here. So to begin with we assume the group is finite so all this counting business makes sense ok. Uh, so let us uh, look at some uh, immediate application of uh, this uh, classification ok. So let us start with group of order p power n ok this is uh, first immediate corollary suppose g has order p power n so group that has order some power of prime those are all called p groups ok if the cardinality of the group is p power n then we can immediately conclude that uh, the center of that group must be non trivial so if cardinality of g is p power n then the center is must be non trivial not only that one can prove that it will have at least p number of elements ok and that is immediate because once center is non trivial the center cardinality of the center must divide the cardinality of g so it uh, must be some p power ok so that is why we should have at least p number of elements ok let us prove this so let us recall the class equation so recall the class equation the classification says the cardinality of g is nothing but the cardinality of the center plus summation the cardinality of g divided by cardinality of cg of x where x comes from very specific indexing set okay so this is our class equation so now you can see that uh, if x is in lambda 1 so then the cardinality of cg of x is strictly less than cardinality of g so that means the cardinality of g divided by the cardinality of cg of x is is actually a proper divisor of cardinality of g so that means it cannot be 1 okay it is more than 1 and it is a it must be a proper divisor. So that means what that means the cardinality of g divided by cardinality of cg of x must be some prime power ok for r greater than or equal to 1. So whatever it is that that simply tells for x in lambda 1 so whatever elements that are there in this sum they are all divided by p that is all it says ok. So if you go modulo p then it is immediate that so p divides this cardinality of g divided by cardinality of cg of x for x in lambda 1. So that implies p divides cardinality of g divided by cardinality of the center but cardinality of g is nothing but p power n that is given so that would imply that p divides the cardinality of g ok. So that means the cardinality of the center is congruent to 0 modulo p. So this proves that the center must have at least p number of elements ok. So p divides the cardinality of the center so that implies the cardinality of the center is at least p ok. So this proves immediately uh, this particular result. So in particularly we can have the following corollary ok. So if you have the order is exactly 
p square so then we can immediately conclude that g is abelian okay so how one can conclude this so note that from the previous corollary the center must be non trivial so that implies the center either has elements p or p square if it is p square then we are done already because if the center has p square number of element then g must be abelian because center of g equal to g so what if it has exactly p number of elements okay so in either case you can see that g modulo the center of g okay so this has either one element or p number of elements but any group of order p is actually cyclic so one can conclude from this g modulo center of g is cyclic i already gave one exercise suppose g modulo center of g is cyclic then immediately one can prove that g is abelian okay so you can use that exercise to immediately conclude that so once you know some information about uh, g modulo the center in particularly if you know it is cyclic then we can immediately conclude g is abelian so that way we can conclude that when g has order p square then g must be abelian so you take it as exercise just use some counting argument and then reprove the same statement use only counting arguments and prove that cardinality of the center cannot be p okay so then that would imply immediately the cardinality of g must be p square so that would imply that g is abelian so this is something you can do just by doing the counting arguments okay uh, let us see uh, some more applications of the same result so in case if we know actually uh, some information about g okay let us say okay so this is some immediate observation from the orbit decomposition so and the previous arguments suppose uh, g has order some p power n okay and uh, g acts on let's say capital x so g acts on capital x so then what we can conclude from the orbit decomposition the cardinality of uh, x is nothing but cardinality of x power g plus summation cardinality of g divided by cardinality of gx where x runs over some index in set lambda 1 so this is what orbit decomposition says so now we can uh, have a closer look at this ratio okay from that what one can immediately conclude uh, that the cardinality of x must be congruent to cardinality of x power g modulo prime p okay so this is immediate so how one proves this so here is the proof so let's look at this ratio cardinality of g divided by cardinality of gx so by definition of this index in set lambda 1 we know that this has to be greater than 1 the cardinality of g divided by cardinality of gx must be greater than 1 note that this is index okay the cardinality of g divided by cardinality of gx is nothing but index of gx inside g using the lagrange's theorem so that means this number must divide cardinality of g so the cardinality of g divided by cardinality of gx must divide the cardinality of g which is p power n and this is greater than 1 and divides p power n so that forces that the cardinality of g divided by cardinality of gx is congruent to zero modulo p so this is the exact same reasoning that we gave for uh, proving that the center of the p group is non trivial 
So, here we are doing for general set capital X. Okay. So, now since this is actually concurrent to 0 modulo p, so which is some element in this sum okay, and each element has this property. So, that means if you look at this entire sum, this must be concurrent to 0 modulo p. Okay. So, from this you can immediately conclude that summation cardinality of g divided by cardinality of g x and this is true for all x in capital lambda 1. Using that you can see that the summation cardinality g divided by cardinality of g x where x runs over this indexing set lambda 1 is going to be 0 modulo p. Okay. So, from this and this orbit decomposition you, you can see that the cardinality of x is clearly cardinality of congruent to cardinality of x power g model op okay so this is somewhat immediate for p groups so in particularly whenever you know some some information about this cardinality of x power g so for example if it is congruent to zero model op then you can immediately conclude that so p must divide cardinality of x okay so very very important corollary so let's look at uh, one immediate application of this. Okay. So, we can prove for example, Cauchy's theorem immediately from this observation. So, let us see what is the statement of Cauchy's theorem. So, which is a very important result in finite group theory. So, Cauchy's theorem state the following. So, again all of this for finite group theory, let G be a finite group. Okay. If P divides the order of G, then there exist an element of G of order P. Okay. So, this is a very, very interesting uh, uh, theorem. Okay. There are many proofs that are available for this theorem. One can use for example, induction to prove this. Okay. So, I will out outline the induction, but I want to give direct proof using uh, group action. Okay. So, both proofs in both proofs actually uses somewhat in uh, group actions, but let us see the first proof. Okay. So, the first, first proof, so this is uh, due to James McKay. So, this he proved uh, this uh, in 1959, this appeared in American Mathematical Monthly. Okay, so that is the proof I want to give. James, okay. So this is in AMM, American Mathematical Monthly, in 1959. So this proof is very very cute proof. Okay, so we construct uh, actually appropriate uh, set capital X and appropriate group let us call it H that H will act on this capital X and immediately using this action we conclude that there are elements of order P inside G. Okay. So, unless you are experienced it is actually difficult to write down this set, okay, but it is kind of magical. So, construct this capital X as follows, you look at all possible P tuples okay, G1 etcetera GP coming from g cross etcetera cross g. So, this is p number of times okay. such that because we are looking for elements of order p inside g. So, you collect all p tuples of elements such that the product is exactly equal to identity. So, this is your set. So, note that uh, identity etcetera identity this element okay, is inside capital X. So, in particularly capital X is non-empty. Okay. So, because the product of identity is just identity okay, even if you do not know there is element of order P still you can conclude that X is non-empty. So, what is your group H? H to you take it to be the cyclic group generated by the cycle 1 to P inside SP. The SP is the symmetric group on P let us, okay, this is the symmetric group on P let us, okay. 
and then you take this cycle 1 to p and then take subgroup generated by this that is inside sp. So, sp naturally act on this g cross g cross g p times ok. So, there is this natural action of sp acts on this g power p which is g cross etcetera g cross g. How it acts it just permutes by permuting the coordinates by permuting the coordinates. So, in some sense this is what motivates us to define this capital X. The capital X is motivated from this action of SP on GP ok. So, now you can use this action of SP on GP to define the action of H on X ok. So, define the action of H on this capital X as follows. Again you just permute the coordinates ok. You take sigma, sigma dot this g 1 etcetera g p is just given by g sigma 1 etcetera g sigma p. So, this is the action that we are talking about. So, why this action well defined because the product of uh, this element g 1 etcetera g p must be identity in that particular law because g is not given to be abelian or anything. g is the general group. So, in that group you are talking about specific product in some specific order. So, that product should be identity. So, we have to verify if you use this sigma coming from capital H. So, then this should give you actually the product which is identity ok. That is that can be verified as follows. So, you suppose g 1 etcetera g p is identity. So, then you can see that g 2 etcetera g p g 1 is also identity by post multiplying g 1 inverse and uh, pre multiplying by g 1. Similarly, you can permute again g 3, g 4 etcetera g p and g 1, g 2 that is also identity. So, you can go as follows as this and this is just a cyclic rotation ok. But look at our group that group is also cyclic rotation group only ok 1 2 p which just rotates which has p number of elements. Then you can see that so by using this uh, uh, elements of h ok. So, by starting with uh, this uh, g 1 etcetera g p you end up at somewhere here ok. But then again you will be getting uh, the product to be identity only. So, so, there are this uh, p number of things equations that comes from g p g 1 etcetera g p minus 1 equal to identity. So, these are all p number of equation number of equations here equal to p and that is all obtained from by applying various elements of this h on this equation. So, that is what happening here. So, that means this element is also in capital X ok. This justify that h acts on capital X ok. Action is group homomorphism bundle can be easily checked because this action indeed coming from this particular thing. I will leave it to you to check. So, now what is the fixed point ok. If you compute x power h what it is? It is exactly you can see that those tuples g 1 etcetera g p such that these are all fixed by h ok. Let us call it g bar. So, sigma g bar should be g bar for all sigma in h, but sigma just permutes ok and it cyclically permutes. So, that means this x power h is nothing but exactly g g g ok, where the product of this g power p should be identity. So, this is coming from h ok, where it is fixed. So, this is. So, that means the number of elements of order p has one to one correspondence with this x power h minus this identity element the tuple identity ok. So, that tells you that it is enough to verify this x power h has cardinality more than 1 ok. But uh, go back to our uh, corollary. So, the result that we proved for if the group is p group then the cardinality of h is congruent to cardinality of uh, x power h ok. The group is h modulo p that is what we have actually observed. 
for any p group this is the case. So, to prove that the cardinality of this uh, x power h is actually congruent to 0 modulo p it is enough to look at the cardinality of x, but what is the cardinality of x in this case cardinality of x is easily computed because so this is p tuples of uh, elements of g such that the product is given to be identity, but this product can be rewritten as follows ok this product actually can be rewritten as g 1 inverse equal to g 2 etcetera g p. That means, so if you know first p minus 1 coordinates or if you know last p minus 1 coordinates 2 to p then the first coordinate can be recovered. That means, this can be naturally identified with that g power p minus 1 ok. So, this is something I will leave it as leave it to you to verify. So, verify that the following map gives you bijective correspondence from g power p minus 1 to capital X. What is the map? You take g 2 etcetera g p tuple and then send it to g <coughs> 2 etcetera g p inverse comma g 2 comma etcetera g p ok. So, now note that the product if you call this is g 1. So, then g 1 times g 2 times etcetera g p is going to be exactly identity ok. So, that means, this is a map from g power p minus 1 to x and I urge you to verify this is indeed bijective correspondence. So, this is actually bijective correspondence. So, that means, the cardinality of x is exactly cardinality of g power p minus 1 ok, but note that p divides the cardinality of g. So, that implies p divides cardinality of x because this is exactly cardinality of g power p minus 1. So, that means p divides the left hand side. So, that implies p divides the cardinality of x power h, but x power h has at least p number of elements. If you just take away that uh, identity identity p tuple identity ok e e e this is one element. If you remove this still we have so many elements in this x power h, but any non trivial element is going to give you order p element in g ok that proves actually g has elements of order p and this proof indeed tells you that immediate corollary. So, this x power h is actually counting the number of elements of g of order p ok let us say minus 1 or maybe like this is uh, minus 1. So, this is also counts you that number of g in g such that g power p equal to identity and we have proved this is exactly concurrent to 0 modulo p ok because identity is always there in this set identity power p is going to be identity, but if you think about it it is exactly number of elements of g order p minus 1 which is exactly congruent to 0 modulo p. So, this you get it as corollary. So, we will see later that how one can generalize this corollary ok. So, so this Cauchy's theorem also can be generalized again further. So, that is called Silo's theorem. So, we will prove Silo's theorem as a corollary of uh, group action again ok. So, I will uh, give another proof of Cauchy's theorem in the next class ok. I will stop it. Thank you.